So why an intergenerational project on Rugeley's childhood memories of World War II? Why indeed? Well, Rugeley over the past 80 years has changed vastly. From a small market town, mining town, to a power station, one of the flagship power stations of Europe, to now the demolition of the power station, the regeneration of the town. But thinking about their past and their town, what do Rugeley young people know? There are certainly a great deal of older generation who do know and have seen the continuous changes in Rugeley. And those memories, those stories, that heritage, that rich heritage of Rugeley will pass with them as they pass, sadly. So, the intergenerational project was born, conceived, the idea. Let's get the young people there, let's train them up on oral history, and let's get them interviewing face-to-face -face the older generation. And what a remarkable adventure, what a remarkable journey it was. Those young people and those older generations shared memories, shared a common heritage. I hope you enjoy watching these interviews. Thank you. I got involved in this project um, through the Youth Council. Um, the leader of the Youth Council invited me to come along and sing and so I was already involved in a community project when I got involved in this. My mum found a, uh, um, an ad on Facebook and she thought it would be interesting and she told us about it and we decided to come. I got involved in this project because I thought it would be a good experience. My history teacher gave me the letter and I read it and I thought it would be a great opportunity. I wanted to learn more about uh, World War II and also learn how to use the camera. The shepherd will I didn't know much about the, the project beforehand, but I knew that we were going to make it in interviewing uh, ch ch children and their experiences of World War II. I only knew that it would be about um, interviewing the, um, the children at the time of World War II. I knew it was going to be interviewing people from the older generation about their memories from their childhood during World War II. Tomorrow, just when I first arrived to training, I, f I felt nervous but excited at the same time because I get to um, try out something new. I was quite nervous because there were some people that I didn't know and I just didn't know what I was going to be doing. I was fairly nervous when I first arrived, however it, it was very, very quickly apparent that I was very much welcome here. It was a nice atmosphere. Um, Everyone treated you. Everyone treated me like I, they'd known me before, and I very, I very quickly settled in. Tomorrow, just you. I was expecting to learn how to interview people and how to operate the camera. I was expecting the project to be quite different, um, and quite interesting, to learn of uh, different perspectives of the war, uh, especially if people's opinions or people's experiences were very different to that of the general kind. I didn't really know what to expect. Um, I was just expecting, you know, take on a few life skills and then just get on with it. Honestly, I think I was quite excited to hear the stories of somebody from a different generation because often I feel like in society we're categorised into our different generations and it's very, very rare that different generations of people actually get to mingle and share their stories amongst one another. I feel as if it's quite important to talk to people of a different generation um, as to understand um, how uh, past events affect them and um, why certain things happen in a certain way. I think it was quite cool to be honest because we're always moaning about how we have to walk the dog or when they've been they have to take refugees to different schools on the other side of Rugeley and stuff. Fate is kind. I've learned that interviewing is actually quite a hard job and but it is really really fun. I learned about different people's lifestyles in World War II. I learned that how it was to live in that time as a child and that how, what you'd have to do like if there's an air raid siren and stuff. I learned to set up a camera, start filming it and how to interview people. I think the main thing that I've learned from the process so far is probably 
how to talk to people, how to really communicate what I want to say and how to guide a conversation and an interview in a way where I really get to learn the interesting stories and the happenings in people's lives. I think the best part of the project was possibly, it's po po possibly the actual interviews themselves, um, being able to sit back and these questions being asked and hearing the, some of the answers there are, it's really, really inspiring. People back then, they went through a hell of a lot more than we've gone through now and I really, really think that that's, that's pretty amazing. Best part of the project would probably be listening to the men and women talking about what they did when they were young in the war. The best part of the project was hearing about hearing stories about people from World War II. I don't think so far there has been a worst part of the project, no. In my opinion the worst part of the project was being interviewed because it's like really nerve wracking. Honestly, I don't think I have a least favourite part. I've really enjoyed everything so far. I would like to find I, I, I would like to find out more more experiences from different point points of view. I'd definitely like to uh, find out the perspective of the female during the wars because they played a different role to males whereas the our male counterparts they were going out and they were actually batting on the front lines. Females were back here and they were processing bombs and ammunitions and it'd be really interesting to hear how that went. I'd like to find out how to edit the videos which I do. It'd be nice to like learn about the like, after the war, like people when they're becoming adults or something afterwards, like see their perspective instead of just a child's perspective. I'd like to find out even more perspectives of World War II because, um, especially from other areas as well, um, because most people who grew up in Rouge would have had a very similar experience, whereas those growing up somewhere else might have had a totally different and possibly even a better or a worse experience of World War II. Troubles melt like lemon drops away. I think it's actually quite good because it's um, improved my confidence and also I know a lot about World War II when we do it in history at school. I could use the skills to probably interview more people and learn more things about the other generations and everything. Be because I, I'm aiming for a career in me media, uh, I, f I feel like I, I could take the skills in filming and record recording and it will assist me if, if I get a job in that area. My mother and her family lived in Rudesley, did live in Rudesley all their lives. Um, but the way that my uh, mother met my father was uh, really because of the war. His family moved, were living in Kent at the time. And Kent being so close to uh, the French coast and the possibilities of the invasion, they considered it safer to move up into Rudesley. My father was working away in Slough, uh, not far from London. He was an apprentice in uh, an aircraft company by the name of Ferry. And when he came up to see his people in Rudesley, I'm not sure how, but he met my mother and things went from there and they were married in, in actual fact, on Christmas Day, 1941. It was allowed then, and during the war, people were allowed to be married during the war, um, during Christmas Day, yeah. I think we, we had fun. Yeah. I was uh, brought up by, really by my grandparents, and the father was away. My mother um, worked for the cooperative society in Rosley, and they were based mainly around uh, Market Square. My father was demobbed in 1947 and uh, apparently um, 
the mother arranged to meet him at Stafford Station, so she took me on the train to Stafford. And much to the amusement of all the people in the carriage, when we arrived at Stafford, I turned around to my mum and said, Is this Germany, mum? There's loads of things we did in the war, you know, like a potato picking and and fishing and uh, catching rabbits and getting eggs. And uh, you know where Morrison's is now? There was a big pool there, Forge Pool, and there was some lovely big roach in there. And I used to catch about three of them on on a Saturday morning and take them home. And I just to scale them and go to them and make a, a meal for us on a Saturday morning. And I was only about eight then, eight or nine then. My mother used to give me a sandwich and we used to go out all day with a bottle of water and a sandwich and that was all we could have. So we used to go down and play down by the river and that, you know. And we learned to swim in the river because there were no swimming baths. And the water was awful. There was a colour works there, oxide, and the river was sometimes blue and green or brown. And then sometimes we used to camp down there and we used to get, of course there was loads of more ends than that, we used to get a dozen more eggs ends in a frying pan and we used to have that for breakfast. Scrambled egg and some bread. Were lovely, lovely times we had, three or four of us. So the war was, I like, we liked the war. We used to sit at night cutting up strips and my mother, she used to make her own peg rugs. She'd get a piece of hessian, an old sack, draw a pattern on it and then we used to sit cutting out strips of old coats or whatever was available and uh, that was how we spent a lot of evenings. The only programmes I can remember listening to is Dick Barton. If we were playing in the street a quarter to seven the door had opened and one of the mothers would shout, Dick Barton's on, and everybody disappeared. <laughs> Every Saturday afternoon you got some pennies to go to the cinema. And the most that you saw was um, Arthur Luke and playing old Mother Riley. And his wife was Kitty McShaney's daughter. And it wasn't smutty or um, suggestive. It was slapstick comedy and it was funny. And you all went... All the children went on a Saturday afternoon to see old Mother Riley. I can see her now. My mother um, used to go to a clinic that is by the uh, old convent that was, and you used to get free orange juice, free cod liver oil, and this malt extract, which was vile. It was like thick treacle, and it stuck all in your mouth. And we had to queue up to get this. There was a man who came round with a bike, and it must have been refrigerated in the compartment in front of his handlebars because he sold goat's ice cream and it's the nicest ice cream I ever tasted. I've never seen it since. When the war broke out, I was, I was young, I was four years old. I didn't have any sisters and brothers, there was just me, mother and me, father. And my dad was a minor. I mean, mother was just looked after, she was just the housekeeper. And my dad used to be in the home guard. He used to, at night time, he used to guard the police station and the, and the, uh, and the post office. He used to have to go every night. He worked in the pit, but he used to have to put his uniform, go, you know, at night time and go first before he went to work. And he used to um, work in the pit at night time, but he'd be guarding the the post office and the and the police station. He guarded the right places, didn't he? <laughs> I think my mother was affected most by the war. Well, she was uh, on edge all the time. She was frightened to death, yeah. and um, she used to kneel down and pray at night time, you know, until the siren went when the war was over. She'd kneel down, on, uh, say on a chair like that on the floor, kneel down and pray. Yeah, because she was scared, you know. I remember that part of it, and that's frightening to see somebody doing that, you know. But it was nice when it was uh, all over.
you know, it was nice, it was a nice feeling that you hadn't got to get up at night and you wouldn't be frightened, you know. Yes, it, it was a scary time. We had one evacuee. Actually, we had two, but they weren't at the same time, they were at different times. One was, uh, they were both from London, one girl, it, one was a girl, her name was Sylvia Carpenter, and the other was called Graham, Graham Bourne, the other one was, but we had them at different times, not at the same time. Graham would be 10, 11, and Sylvia was 6. I used to have to be in charge. I said I used to have to get them to school at Slittingville, and I hated that because I had to go from Agley Road all up, you know, to you know where the cricket field is, that um, there, so, and then I used to watch them go up the hill, and then I used to dash but down and get go to the Catholic school. <laughs> you know, they were they were they went home with with clothes and things when they went back after the war, you know. Because my dad treated them the same as he treated me. You know, they both, they were looked after all right, you know, and they were fed and clothed. The evacuees, yeah, you know, they've been friends ever since. They have kept in touch with us, you know. That was something, weren't they? You know, when you'd looked after them. And Well, fruit was, I think, one of the worst things for rationing um, because you had to queue uh, for fruit uh, and use your coupons. My mother <laughs> came home one day with some bananas, which she'd had to queue for for quite a while, came home with a banana for me, and I didn't like it. <laughs> so that didn't go very well. Uh, and sweets, well, sweets. They were like um, a present, really. You had to, once you had used your coupons up, you had to wait for the next week for the, some more coupons to your sweets. So, uh, as I said, you you took pride in what you had. Uh, I can remember um, in the town hall where you had to go with your coupons to get certain people could get powdered milk and orange juice uh, until rationing finished. So these are the kind of things that you uh, you didn't take for granted. You, you had to, you know, if you didn't like them, well, tough, that was it. You didn't get any more to next week. Well, clothes, um, we were lucky in all's fair, there was a men's shop but um, and a ladies' shop. But as I say, obviously things that, uh, were redone. If you had a, a long pair of trousers, uh, it had been a short pair of trousers uh, and things like that for the... So things were recycled. There was one programme which I think all the children listened to and it was called The Oval Teenies Club. But that's the only thing that I remember about uh, radios, wireless, wireless as they were called then. Except one particular thing. Next door to the to the uh, street where I, where I was born was a garage and wirelesses in those days the power for them was an accumulator well it was called an accumulator but it really was a battery and it was a glass about so tall and it was square glass and you could see the elements inside the glass made of lead maybe or something and it was full of liquid. And I used to take this accumulator from, from my mum and dad, and, and my granddad as well, my grandma, grandma and granddad as well, take them to the garage for charging, because they would run down, take them to the garage, and their garage would put them on charge. But they were rather heavy, and I used to, I remember, I used to struggle with them to get to the garage. And some of this liquid in it used to leak out of the top and run down my leg. And it, it was sore. I learned later that it, was, that it was hydrochloric acid. And so this acid was burning, burning my leg. But it, it, I didn't, it didn't matter to me. 
I was just a little bit uncomfortable for a while, but the most important thing was getting the battery charged, getting it back in the wireless so that I could listen to the oval skinnies. I uh, started school in 1943. I had an incident with one of the school teachers when we was allowed two ounces of sweets a week from out of, our, out of my, my mother's poop and she used to tear a little thing out with just two ounces. I took it to the shopkeeper and they gave me two ounces of sweet, sweets. I took them to school and I was eating one and the school teacher took the sweets off me and uh, she put them in the drawer and said you can have them at, at the end of the day. I've never seen them, so she must have met them. <laughs> so, you know, uh, that wasn't very nice, was it? When it's only two inches I was going to get that week. <laughs> you got two inches a week and that was it. At home, you know, the one thing I noticed, I could remember very clearly when I was around the age of five, six, was that the windows, they were all black, roller blinds. No, no curtains, all that, roller blinds, all down. Uh, didn't use much electric, it was all candles, candles and more candles. If you was in bed and you up to hear the, happened to uh, the other occasion you heard the sound of an aeroplane, we used to, there was four, four brothers in this one room, we all used to get out of bed and get underneath, get underneath the bed out the road kind of thing. You know, it's the only thing you could do because we hadn't got air raid shelves in the, in the vicinity of crossroads where we lived. We used to play cricket in the road, we used to get a dustbin lid and put a stick through the, the handle in the middle of the road. And it wasn't a cricket ball, but it was a hard ball we used to play cricket with. And if it, it, if it hits this lid, you're out. You'd, you'd hear it, you wouldn't have to play. We did keep some pigs, and we used to have a kid, pig killed every now and again. And I used to watch this pig being killed, really. <laughs> which I suppose now when you think about it, it, it's horrible. But to me, it was one of those things that just happened. And the man that killed the pig, he didn't live very far away from us. And he, he'd have a, a very big scrub top table, not a very high one at all, probably about 18 inches high or something like that. And he'd take the pig out of the pig's tie, walk the pig along to this, this table, walk the pig along to this table, and he'd get somebody to help him pull the pig onto it and fasten the pig down, and then they'd cut the pig's throat, wouldn't they? And of course, when the pig was killed and they all cleaned it all out and everything like that, my uncle used to cure it in the front room that we called it, but there was two halves to it, took all the innards out and everything like that, which really and truly, we threw nothing away. My granny used to clean the innards from the pig which was called chitlins in them days. She used to do it three times a day in cold, running salt water. And her hands used to be blue with the cold because of, of, of washing it. And then she boiled all them chitlins up, which to me, they was beautiful. <laughs> then when the, when, when the pig was cured, we'd hang it up on the stairs. As we went up the stairs, it, it'd be on the wall, there'd be a big, uh, sheep put on the wall and then when we wanted any bacon my granny would just go and get some, get a big knife and cut some strips of bacon off. It was September the war broke out but we had to have blackouts for a start off. Every window had to be blacked out so we couldn't show a light after five of, well as soon as it was dark everything was blacked out. And of course all cars on the road had to have special lighting on. They was reduced down to something like that. A shower a, 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 over the, the, the light and just a sh little light like that shining through. So people could see where they were going like. So it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. Of course playtime then, we were, we were allowed out during the evening time. Although it was pitch dark, we used to love it. Because we could do what we liked then. Some things we shouldn't do, but we did. And of course, in the early 1940, when I was going into 10 years old, the first sirens went off, and of course the bombs didn't drop round here, but the planes going over at night was very plain, and you could tell that the weight of the bombers 
going over was very loud and heavy and there was a droning sound to it all the time. And of course when they returned, the sirens went off, the, light, the lightness of the planes going over was so much different after they dropped the bombs, wherever they dropped. Of course, when they bombed places like Coventry and different places, we could see the fires, you could see the flames in the sky. Oh 